Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. This is the last video of the year that I'm going to be making. Uh, it's the unboxing video of the Macroeconomics FRQs Set 2. These, uh, these exam questions just came out a few hours ago. I've done my best to answer them as I think the rubrics are going to be looking for, or these are the answers I think they're going to be looking for at the, at the reading or at the scoring of these exams. Uh, before we get started, I want to let you know I really appreciate all the support you guys have given ReviewEcon.com this year. Thank you for watching all the videos and buying review booklets and all of that. Um, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to sub subscribe to the channel and like the videos. It really helps me with, out with the ab algorithm. Uh, and all right, let's go ahead and get into it. Now remember, I don't work for the College Board, so I don't know uh, for sure that these are the answers they're going to be looking for. I'm basing this on my knowledge of economics and past rubrics. So here we go. First question, we're going to assume that the economy of Moneyland is in equilibrium with an actual unemployment rate equal to the natural rate of unemployment. First thing we're doing is drawing a correctly labeled graph of the aggregate demand, short run aggregate supply, long run aggregate supply, and we're going to show those things. All right, typical uh, graph at long run equilibrium. There we are. Uh, we got our upward sloping short run aggregate supply, downward sloping aggregate demand, and the uh, in, at that intersection, we have the long run aggregate supply curve. We have YF and Y1 below on the X axis. We have the price level marked as well, and we have our axes labeled properly. There we go. On to the next part. We're going to assume that consumer spending in Moneyland decreases from 110,000 down to 100,000. So people are spending $10,000 less, and that is as a result of a decrease in disposable income in Moneyland from 135,000 down to 110,000. We're going to calculate the marginal propensity to consume in Moneyland, and we're going to show our work. So we have a change in income of $25,000. We have a change in spending of one hundred of $10,000, and we're going to calculate that uh, marginal propensity to consume. Here it is. We take the change in spending and divide it by the change in income, and that gives us a marginal propensity to consume of 0.4. On to the next part. We're going to show the short run effect of the decrease in consumer spending in Moneyland on your graph in part A. We're going to label it uh, the new uh, uh, output and price level Y2 and PL2. So we have less consumer spending. That's going to be a leftward shift of the aggregate demand curve that lowers our price level and lowers our real output. Now we have a recessionary gap, by the way. On to the next part. Following the decrease in consumer spending, explain how the economy would adjust in the long run uh, uh, in absence of any policy action. So no actions by the Fed or the, or, the, uh, or the government. So what's gonna happen? Here we go. Since there is now a recessionary gap, wages and other resource prices will fall. Now you don't have to say the other resource prices, but you could say those instead of wages. And that's going to cause the short run aggregate supply curve to shift to the right because of these lower input uh, costs, all right? And you, that will happen until real output equals YF. There we go, or the full employment level of output. On to part D. The central bank of Moneyland is concerned about the short run effects of the decrease in consumer spending on the broader economy and they're considering taking action. So they have a ample reserve system and we're going to identify a specific action they can take to increase consumer spending back to where it was. All right, so this is ample reserve, so there's only two possibilities. Decrease administered rates, which is both the discount rate and interest on reserves, or decreasing interest on reserves. Either one of those should work. On to the next part, we're gonna draw a correctly labeled graph of the reserves market. And based on that policy we just identified, it identified uh, the, uh, the decrease in administered rates. So I'm gonna shift down both the upper and lower portion of the demand for reserves. Remember the demand for reserves has an upper flat portion, a middle downward sloping portion, and a lower end that is also flat. And since they have ample reserves, the supply curve uh, for the reserves market is going to intersect the demand curve in the lower flat portion. You have your policy rate marked and the whole curve shifts down and we see uh, the whole demand curve that is shifts downward because of the decrease in administered rates and that gives us a new lower policy rate as we have marked there. On to F, how would the change in the policy rate shown on your graph in part E affect each of the following in Moneyland in the short run? 
the quantity uh, quantity of national savings. Now, so interest rates have gone down, remember, and savers get paid these interest rates. Well, this is, since we are not being paid as much interest, that means that people aren't going to be willing to save as much. So it's going to decrease. No explanation needed, decrease is fine. On to part uh, FII, what happens to unemployment? And now we have to explain. So here's the answer. Uh, unemployment is going to decrease. The lower interest rate, uh, the, the lower policy rate will cut, increase, or will, excuse me, will decrease uh, interest rates across the economy. And that leads to more gross investment and other uh, interest rate sensitive spending as well. Uh, and that's going to shift aggregate demand to the right, which increases real output. And I think you're going to, I think you're going to need to say real output to, uh, because th that's the connection to the unemployment change, I think. All right, that's what I think they're gonna be looking for. On to number two, the table provided shows the quantity and price of food and clothing, uh, the only two goods produced in the country uh, of Maltrose, Maltrose, I don't know, all right, in year one and year two. Assume that year one is the base year. First, we're going to calculate nominal GDP in year one, and we're going to show our work. Remember nominal, you take the quantities for the current year, times that by the current year prices and then sum it up. So there we go, we've got the 10 times the 13 for the food, we've got the 20 units times the $4 for clothing, add them up, that's $210. There we go, that's our nominal GDP for year two. All right, on to part B, we're going to calculate the GDP deflator for year two. And this time we're gonna show our work again. So uh, we remember, we just calculated the nominal GDP, that was current year quantities times the base year, or times the current year prices. And now for real, we have to, uh, or for the GDP deflator, we have to calculate the real GDP, which is the current year quantities times the uh, base year prices. So there we go, we're gonna, there we go. There's our real GDP calculations. It's the ten dollars times the ten uh, times the, it's the ten times the ten, and then the twenty times the five, and that equals two hundred dollars. There we go. And then we follow up with the math of showing the uh, two hundred and ten uh, divided by that's the re, that's the uh, the nominal two hundred and ten divided by the real of two hundred times one hundred, uh, which is. Uh, 105 and I think you're gonna need to know have show that calculation for calculating real as well because if you used uh, the base the uh, year one quantities uh, you're actually gonna get the same $200 I think so uh, so I think you're gonna have to show that to prove that you were calculating using the correct numbers all right on to part C what was the numerical value of the inflation rate from year one to year two so in order to calculate that, we're going, we have our 100 uh, GDP deflator for the base year because the base year is always 100 and we already calculated 105 for the GDP deflator for the current year. So we're going to do new minus old divided by old times 100 and that gives us 5% inflation. There we go. All right, on to the next part. Assume that the expected inflation rate between years one and two was 3% uh, where uh, were each of the following better off or worse off or unaffected? First of all, we have people living on fixed incomes. Remember, inflation was higher than expected. People with fixed incomes don't have the ability to earn more money because their incomes are fixed. So they are going to be worse off. You don't have to say why, just worse off. Now, what about borrowers with fixed interest rate loans? And here we have to explain. Now, uh, borrowers when interest rates or when inflation rates are higher than expected, they are actually better off. And the reason why is because the higher than expected inflation means that borrow borrowers pay back fewer real dollars than expected. I think that's all you're gonna be needing, but I think you could also could say, and pay lower than expected real interest rates, all right? Moving on to number three, assume that Jamaica has a cyclical unemployment rate of 4% and a balanced Capital and Financial Account, or CFA. We're going to identify a specific fiscal policy action that Jamaica's government could uh, would take to bring its economy to full employment. Well, since we have a uh, have cyclical unemployment, that means there's a recession, this re recessionary gap. So, decrease taxes or increase government spending is the fiscal policy action we're looking for. For B, based solely on the short run change in real output. Here's the, this is the thing, you gotta be careful I think, making sure you only focus on the change in real output here, not the change in the price level or anything else, or, or interest rate, just the real output resulting from the fiscal policy action. What's going to happen to Jamaica's net exports and we have to explain. Now I'll admit, 
I am not 100% sure what they're looking for on the explain, but I do know that when real output changes, and in this case, uh, real output uh, 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 was increasing, it means that, uh, that people buy more imports. So I put decrease because the higher real output means higher real national income. Right, that's my connection because the national income I think is the catalyst that they might be looking for. The higher national income means Jamaican citizens buy more input or imports. All right there you go. I think that'll be enough, but I but I'm I'm waiting to see the rubric on this one myself. All right, on to the next part. Uh, for part C, assume that Jamaica and Turkey are trading partners with flexible exchange rates. Uh, we're going to draw a uh, a foreign exchange market graph for the uh, Jamaican dollar relative to the lira. And we're going to show the impact on the supply of the Jamaican dollar. Now remember, uh, Jamaican citizens are buying more imports. That means Jamaican citizens will be supplying more of their currency, uh, the Jamaican dollar, uh, in the markets. So that's going to be a rightward shift of the supply curve and a decrease in the exchange rate. All right, on to the next part for part D. How will the change in net exports identified in part B affect Jamaica's capital and financial account explain? Now remember, these uh, the uh, imports and exports, this change in imports, that is actually counted in the current account, right? And the money is leaving because of the imports. So what's gonna happen in the capital and financial account? Remember, they always have to balance each other out. They always, always do. And the reason why, so here's my reason or, or my answer, increase because the decrease in net exports will cause a deficit in the current account. That deficit must be paid, uh, that should be through the sale of Jamaican assets and the inflow will cause the capital financial account to have a surplus, all right? So that's what I think is going to be the answer. I don't know if they need all, or are gonna need all of that information in there. Uh, they might just accept because there's a deficit in the current account, there must be a, uh, a uh, surplus in the capital financial account. That might be enough. I'm not 100% sure, but, but I think that'll be it. All right, there you go. Those are my best guest answers for set two. Uh, before we get going here, I really want to remind you how much I appreciate all of your support of ReviewAcon.com. Let me know what you think about my answers. Put your thoughts in the comments below. I don't know if I'll be able to respond to all of them, but I will really appreciate it. Thank you again. Take care, everybody. I'll see you all next time.